Okay, good afternoon. Uh, welcome to the Garden Hour with MU Extension. Well, it sure is hot in my part of the state, and um, I just hope we're looking for a cool down soon, because I tell you, I've been out working with plants all morning, and I just was dripping with sweat, and I was just really surprised, because last week we had really nice weather, and now we're just um, almost in a sauna. Uh, we're glad that you're able to join us today, maybe cooling off for the noon hour. Uh, my name is Donna Optenberg, and I'm your host for today. I'm located in the southeast region of the state, down by Cape Girardeau. Uh, we have a lot of great information for you today and uh, lots of cool looking pictures. Um, and, and, and as always, sit back and enjoy. Uh, definitely keep uh, bringing those questions in with pictures. Um, you get to the state map. My computer will work. There we go. Um, so uh, here's a map of all the specialists around the state. Just take a look at the state, um, your portion of the state, and see who represents you. Um, that is your go-to person. If that position is open, um, just go to the next person, and that will be your um, contact person. Um, so um, with us today, uh, we have Jennifer Shooter from the Northwest, Northeast region in Kirksville, Katie Kamler from East Central by St. Genevieve, Kathy Meacham in the Northwest region in Carrollton, um, Kelly McGowan in the Springfield area, Tamara Rial from Kansas City, and from campus we have Jared Folk. Uh, we may have some extra time for question today, questions today. So if you do have a question, um, shoot them to Kathy, who has changed her name to ask your questions here. Um, make sure to include your email address so that if we do run out of time, uh, we can still answer questions and get in contact with you. Uh, we are going to start with the weather report um, from Pat Ganan. Thank you, Donna, and good afternoon, everyone. I think uh, sauna is a very appropriate term that Donna mentioned in regard to how it's been feeling the past few days. And I thought I'd drill down a little deeper just to show how unusual this weather pattern is. And indeed, the numbers are reflecting that. Of course, as Donna mentioned, the up and down nature of uh, cool conditions last week. And uh, but look what's happened over the past few days. We're breaking some record high temperatures across the state. I'm using Columbia, Missouri data here as a mid midpoint for the state. But it's, it's safe to say much of the state, we're just seeing some record highs and unusually high dew point temperatures. The, the dew point temperature is the temperature at which the air becomes saturated. And when you have dew points in the 70s, is, which is what we've been experiencing the past few days, that's highly uncomfortable. And that, and that leads to very high heat indices that can be very unhealthy for people, for um, uh, pets and livestock, as well as vegetation, it can be stressful. But it's acting like July, not May. And the numbers are really reflecting that. In the upper right, I just wanted to provide some historic context on how unusual this weather is when we have record highs, obviously that is unusual, but combined with these high dew points, we're seeing heat indices that are in the mid to upper 90s, even triple digit, which is really unusual. We have records uh, going back over 50 years at the Columbia Regional Airport. And I, what I looked at were the number of hours and particular dates during the month of May where we saw heat, in, heat indices greater than or equal to 95 degrees. It's only happened 14 times in 53 years. And so you can see the, the dates and the number of hours that we had heat indices of 95 or higher right here at the bottom in this red box is the past couple of days. Um, three hours at the airport, we had heat indices above 95 and then seven hours yesterday. So indeed, this is highly unusual. The map on the lower right or this table here shows uh, yesterday, we actually had triple digit heat indices. That has not ever happened over the past 53 years during the month of May, let alone the first half of May. So just uh, incredible heat combined with the high dew points has translated to some highly unusual, uncomfortable July-like conditions. We've had strong southerly wind the past couple of days and from the surface all the way up to 5,000 feet, that wind has been out of the south blowing quite strongly and that's straight out of the Gulf of Mexico. So we're getting all this Gulf of Mexico moisture air right over Missouri. 
And in combination with the antecedent conditions, it's been very wet. We have a very wet soil profile across the state and that's translated to efficient evaporative loss and just creating these very uncomfortable conditions uh, over the past few days. Rainfall over the past week does indicate, um, we've had a few days of drier conditions, but obviously last week when we visited, we had, uh, we were just uh, at the end of a big rain event at, where a lot of rain fell across Southwest Missouri with notable flooding as well. Anywhere from four to over seven inches of precipitation over the past seven days. Lighter amounts, but still significant totals across generally the Southern half of the state. Lighter totals across Northern Missouri. Uh, we have had some drying opportunities, of course, with these high temperatures and strong winds that has dry, dried out the topsoil somewhat and providing some opportunities to get out in the field or the garden and to, to do some planting perhaps, but very uncomfortable conditions, at least the past few days. The soil temperatures have reacted to these very warm temperatures. Again, looking at some of the Columbia data as the midpoint for the state, the blue line is the long-term uh, two inch bare soil temperature for much of, the, much of May and the red line is what we've been experiencing over the past few days. You can see cool conditions last week and of course these, these unusually high temperatures. We're experiencing soil temperatures, average soil temperatures running in the 70s at the two inch depth. On the right, this is just from a few minutes ago. These are the soil temperatures from the Missouri Mesonet indicating again, very warm conditions generally in the 70s, even some 80s for the bare soil temperatures. It does look like uh, this sauna-like weather is gonna stick around obviously for today, tomorrow, and even into a little bit of Friday. There, are, there is relief on the way in the form of a weak cold front to our north and west. It's expected to move into the state by tomorrow night across northwestern parts of Missouri, bringing chances of showers and thunderstorms starting in northwest Missouri. That will translate eastward and southeastward as we go through the course of the day on Friday and into Friday night even some chances of precipitation in the far southeast of Missouri on Saturday morning. You, uh, these hot and humid conditions will, will also thankfully translate eastward and southeastward as that front moves through the state. It looks like a much nicer weekend, at least cooler, a little bit less humid, but nonetheless still above average temperatures. I mean, typically this time of year, our average highs are generally around the mid seventies. And so, uh, we won't see any 90s, but temperatures could climb into the upper 70s and lower 80s on Saturday and Sunday. And you can see the min temperatures over the next few days here. And then on the bottom here, these are the max temperatures as we go into the weekend. Obviously, very uncomfortable conditions today with highs reaching again near record highs in the lower 90s across much of the state. A little bit more cloudier conditions um, for, for today and tomorrow. Um, some hot temperatures, but for by Friday, more clouds associated with that front will temper the temperatures a little bit, bring them down a little bit, but still above average in the mid to upper 80s. By Saturday, you can see Saturday and Sunday, much nicer conditions. It looks like perhaps the pick day of the entire week will be on Sunday with those cooler conditions and less humid as well, which will be nice. Forecast of precipitation over the next seven days, uh, it does, of course, we had that chance of precipitation starting Thursday night in Northwest Missouri and then across much of the state into Friday and Friday night. That could amount to as much as a half to one inch of precipitation. Uh, some folks will receive less, some will receive more due to the localized nature of these scattered showers and thunderstorms. There are some additional chances for next week for precipitation, especially early to the middle part of next week. Uh, there could be a couple systems impacting our state with more chances of showers and thunderstorms but at least it does look like anywhere from a half to one inch um, general amounts over the next seven days. The forecast for next week, it's, uh, uh, I don't think it's gonna be as hot and humid as we've experienced this week. It's just so unusual to experience this kind of weather this time of year. Nonetheless, they are indicating above normal temperatures to persist, especially across the Southern Plains. It's terrible conditions there in regard to the drought that has been ongoing. Uh, conditions are only going to worsen as we go into next week. So we need to keep an eye out, out for that. But obviously uh, they, they are indicating some above normal temperatures to continue into next week. So I wouldn't be surprised to see some of these 80s to continue for high temperatures next week, lows in the uh, upper 50s to into the 60s. And on the right, this is a forecast of precipitation for next week. Unfortunately, below average precipitation where they need it the most with, the, with that continuing drought. 
more near normal conditions here in Missouri, across most of Missouri. And you know, May is typically our wettest time of year. And so what would that would translate to near normal would be for that time period, be about an inch, an inch and a quarter uh, of rain in regard to precipitation. So, so Donna, hang in there with this heat and humidity. It does look like we are gonna get some relief as we go into the weekend. Thanks so much. Thank you, Pat. Yes, I'm, I'm just hoping for <laughs> that cooler weather. Um, so uh, at this point, I will turn it over to Jennifer as your moderator. Thank you, Donna. We had a question that came in on the avian influenza. And the question is, with the Asian bird flu, I am reading that we should refrain from putting out bird baths and bird feeders. Does MU Extension support this advice? which seems to make sense. And does that also include hummingbird feeders? And Kathy is going to address this question. Thanks, Jennifer. So uh, when we got this question, I contacted uh, Bob Pierce, the MU Extension Wildlife and Fisheries Specialist, and he uh, reported that yes, we can continue feeding the hummingbirds and as well as the other birds. So the avian influenza numbers are dropping and it isn't necessary to remove the feeders. The virus doesn't uh, tolerate the heat very well. And we, as we know, we're certainly in that. So we really shouldn't have a problem this summer. However, you know, as the numbers drop in the fall, uh, there could be, um, we could see um, the flu uh, numbers go up again. So you just watch for any uh, sick or dying birds then. And, um, the, just to be sure, the um, uh, just so you know, the transmission from birds to humans is rare, but it's still important to keep your feeders and your bird baths clean. And so you really want to try to change the water every day. This prevents mosquito larvae from hatching. And once a week, scrub your bath uh, with a brush, mild soap, and soap and water every week to remove the algae. If you do see a dead or sick birds, report it to the Missouri Department of Conservation or uh, MU's Veterinarian Diagnostic Lab. And we're gonna put in the chat a link that Bob provided for us with more information. And that's all I have. All right, thank you, Kathy. Well, people are starting to buy, or they already have bought warm season bedding plants. And there's just a lot of bedding plants out there available at local uh, nurseries and garden centers. And people also have questions about watering bedding plants. So Donna is going to tell us about choosing a healthy bedding plant as well as watering. So we are in the prime of, of picking bedding plants, buying them and planting them. So I get a lot of questions about what, what is a good bedding plant to pick or what should I be looking for? And for the one, first thing I wanna talk about is good foliage color. Uh, a dark green or medium green can, is, a, is a signifier of a healthy plant. Uh, try not to pick plants that are yellowing or have brown edges. Always try to stick with plants that have that, that darker green or the medium green. And, and sometimes that green varies based on what variety you're picking. And that's why I say it can be a medium green. And uh, so basically avoid anything that's not green. <laughs> um, keep it going, there you go. Um, another thing is you wanna make sure that the plants are nice and filled out um, and a good size for that variety and that for that size of pot that it's in. Um, you know, a lot of times these trays are crowded together. And so when you're, going and picking plants, they look like they're really nice and full until you pull that plant away from the other pots. And so that's one thing I encourage you to do when you're looking and browsing, shuffle those plants around and take a look at how big they truly are. Because a lot of times they're a lot smaller than what they look like. Um, you want one with um, good branching, good size, lots of uh, growth tips. Once again, no browning, no yellowing. Um, but a good size for that pot because uh, plants are expensive. So I want you to be able to get your money's worth. Make sure they're compact and bushy. 
Um, you know, not everything's like a tomato plant I put on the left. You know, the bigger the tomato plant, just you, you can sink it. So all that, that stem can become uh, a lot of roots. Not all plants are like that. So we have to really be prepared to look around, look for plants that once again, fill their pot, um, have nice, compact, bushy growth. You don't want anything long and lanky. You don't want stems that are bent. You don't want um, long inner nodes. So that's um, this, the distance between the two nodes. And you want a lot of good growing tips, especially when you're dealing with herbs or annuals um, and, and even perennials. You want um, to buy something you know, worth the money that you're paying for. And, once, and this is one of my favorite things to do is pull the plants out of their pots. Uh, the roots of the, of the plant should be white and they can be off-white, but we try to avoid um, brown roots or black roots. Um, and you want quite a few roots. And you know, if it's got one or two roots and you can tell that it was just transplanted, that's one thing. But if you can tell it's been in that pot a while and you pull it out and there's very little roots at the edge of the pot, then you might go, well, I don't know if I really want that plant. And, and I will say, if the, if the nursery person says something to you or the person that's working that, that department at the store, just tell them you're looking for a healthy plant. Most times they'll, they'll, they'll say, okay, just make sure to put the, the plant nicely, firm it back into the pot um, and put it back on the shelf if you don't want it. Um, I always tell people, if, you, if it's white roots, put them in your cart. If they're black or brown roots, put them back. Um, because they're just not worth even trying to nurse back to health. Once those root rod um, pathogens set into that root system, that plant's just going to continue to decline, and odds are you're not going to be able to pull it out of it. So once again, pull the plant, plant out of the pot and take a look at those roots, because it does make a difference. Also, I always try to encourage people to avoid plants with blooms. Go ahead, look at the tray. If, it's, if that bloom is what you want, the color that you want, then seek out the same plant in that tray without blooms. Plants will establish a lot quicker if they have no blooms. Um, if you can't help but buy a plant with blooms, pinch that bloom off uh, right prior to planting. That way that plant has the message of, I want you to establish that root system so that they will have a better root system quicker. If a plant is blooming and you sink it in the ground, it's, you know, the message to that plant is bloom, 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 and it tends not to put as much of an emphasis on that root system. So definitely try to pick plants without blooms. Um, so, and don't forget, if you're buying plants from a greenhouse or a shaded area at, at a retailer, make sure that you harden off your plants before you stick them out in full blazing sun. And a lot of that has to do with those plants have been protected from the wind and a lot of the sun rays by being in a greenhouse or a shade structure. Um, and you will, will want to take that plant and gradually um, acclimate it to full sun, full wind, harsh and harsher environment type conditions. Um, and so just keep that in mind. Um, acclimation might take a few days. It may take up to seven days, just depending on the weather that we're having. You wanna put them in a protected spot outdoors and grad gradually expose them to light conditions and more windy um, type conditions over about one week. So it can take up to seven to 10 days to do this. And then the other question we're having a lot of it, um, is that our soils are wet or they're really moist um, in some areas. Um, and so the question is, do we still need to water in our plants if the soil is already wet? Well, the, the answer to that is yes. Regardless of that soil moisture, you want to make sure that plant is watered in very well after planting. And this does a few things. One is it settles that soil back into place and it also settles those roots so that those roots can start establishing in that existing soil. It helps that soil to have a good contact uh, with the roots. And, and once again, it encourages and speeds up that establishment. And when you water, you know, I know a lot of people will just take a little cup and they'll water um, gently over the roots. Well, gently is great, but you need to water thoroughly. A little cup isn't going to do it. Make sure that you're watering thoroughly to get the whole um, root depth of that plant. So a lot of times if we're just doing a little water can or a little cup at a time, 
it's not wetting the, the root ball thoroughly. And the one thing I did uh, miss on, I'm making a point of, when you're doing the transplanting, make sure that that root ball is moist because if it's too dry, if you plant it, it's not going to become wet. So it needs to have some moisture in it before the, it gets planted. And then you add moisture once it is planted. Okay, Jennifer, that's all I have. Back to you. Thank you, Donna. And now Katie is going to talk about what is in bloom around the state. Yes. So this time of year, all right, are you seeing the right screen? Yes. Okay. So this time of year, I love getting out and about and seeing what is in bloom. Uh, you know, I used to go mushroom hunting and um, what I always found during mushroom hunting was actually uh, seeing what was blooming. Uh, so I finally just basically given up on mushroom hunting and go wildflower hunting instead. And Donna Kelly and I had an opportunity to do some hiking in um, the South Central Missouri uh, this last week. And uh, it's fun to go with other horticulturalists. So nobody complains when we all stop and look at all the flowers. Uh, so this is just a short snippet of a view that we saw uh, last week. So on the cover here is Golden Alexander. Another name for it is Wild Parsnip. Charillium is another one that is blooming right now. It's one of my favorites. Those three leaves are pretty obvious uh, and uh, they do come in different colors and they are native to, to um, a lot of the, the um, north, uh, northern states and eastern states and of course Missouri. So this is kind of the maroon or brown trillium. Uh, obviously very distinctive with those three leaves and that very different flower. Dwarf larkspur is blooming now. Uh, it's, uh, as you can see, some color variations here. Uh, and then there's another color variation that has the back of that uh, flower is actually more uh, blue or purple. Uh, so this is a fun one to see and uh, one that I always enjoy. The other neat thing about this one, it makes great pressed flowers. If you're uh, growing any type of, of larkspur or delphinium in your own garden, this is the native variety. There are also many horticultural varieties out there. Uh, Jack in the Pulpit is a fun one. Uh, it was funny because at first I thought I was seeing terillium leaves that weren't blooming because in the bottom of this picture, you can see those, once again, that three leaf. But I was like, oh, that doesn't look quite right until I saw it blooming. I was like, oh, yes, those are Jack in the Pulpit. Uh, so um, it has that very distinct name, a green flower. So you really have to be uh, looking for it. But we saw quite a few Jack in the Pulpits blooming in various spots. Uh, this was a fun uh, spot. This was a bluff, and I have always been a lover of ferns. I did not particularly look up to see what, what variety of fern this was, but uh, the mosses and, and lichens growing on the rocks. The columbine was on this bluff, blooming beautiful. Um, when the columbine is blooming, that is usually a good indication of when to put out your hummingbird feeders because it is one of the first native plants that is very attractive to hummingbirds. And uh, that, that's always my indication. The columbine is blooming, I'll put out my hummingbird feeders. Also on this bluff, it was neat to see, and I would think uh, later in the season, uh, this plant here and here, this was the wild native hydrangea was actually also on this bluff. Wild geranium, we saw lots and lots of wild geranium, which uh, was very pretty in, on that, that woodland floor. Uh, and it makes a great background, those different leaf textures. And of course, then there's some poison ivy in there too. So, you know, be careful when out walking in the woods. This is the yellow native honeysuckle. I was so excited uh, to see this. We actually stopped in the road to get out and take a picture of this because this is the first time while I knew we had native honeysuckle, this is the first time I'd ever actually got to see it in person uh, and growing wild. So it was neat too because the wild geranium was in the background. 
You can also see with this native honeysuckle, the leaves wrap around that stem and look very different than the invasive honeysuckles that we deal with. Oh, uh, we were excited to see this one, uh, and it wasn't a milkweed that I was familiar with. This is called a four-leafed milkweed, or uh, I think we also heard it recall, called world milkweed because the leaves were in uh, sets of four rolled around the stem. So this is a milkweed that is blooming very early and uh, was neat to see. There's lots and lots of different kinds of milkweed. Uh, this is a fun one. It's called yellow star grass. It's not actually a grass. Uh, it is in the lily family and uh, really pretty, those bright, bright yellow star-shaped flowers. There's another one called blue-eyed grass that I also have blooming right now that is another favorite of mine, another one that's in the lily family. Wild ginger, uh, you know, I've heard about wild ginger for a long, a long time, know what it is. People use it in their landscapes, but this was the first time I'd actually got to see it uh, in its native environment. So lots of those heart-shaped leaves. And this is what the bloom looks like. The bloom isn't showy, it's underneath that foliage. And once again, some poison ivy in the picture. So, so uh, we should have made a game to see how much poison ivy you could also spot. Another favorite, rose verbena. Uh, this is, uh, most people are familiar with verbena, uh, the horticultural varieties, which come in all colors and variations, which are fun. This is the native rose verbena, and it likes to grow in the Ozarks and in, in rocky, bluffy areas. And um, it is neat because it will bloom all summer long. The other interesting thing about it is depending on where you have it in the state, depending on soil type, the color is a little different. In some areas it's more purple, in some areas it's more rose colored. And that's the last one I have. I had many, many more uh, pictures of wildflowers that, that we saw, but I decided I'd better limit it because we, we didn't have enough time to share them all. But I encourage you with the weather being nice to get out and, and enjoy the uh, native plants of Missouri. Thank you, Katie. And yes, it is fun to walk through the woods and look at all the, the native wildflowers. And uh, I went mushroom hunting with my son last weekend and I did more wildflower hunting, like you said, uh, than I did mushroom hunting but we weren't finding very many mushrooms. And uh, yeah, I was stopping to admire the flowers and take photos of them. And it is fun just to walk around uh, in the woods or a woodland area and look at all the pretty wildflowers. So thank you for sharing uh, your wonderful pictures there. I'm glad you had that opportunity to, to go out and see all those. It was a lot of fun. Okay, so now it is time for our weekly friend or foe with Tamara. Hi everyone. All right, so let me go ahead and get this up. All right, so you should be able to see something and let me go ahead and launch the poll. So is this an, a friend or a foe, neither, or does it depend? I'll give you a few more seconds. All right, we have a fairly confident crowd on this one. All right, so three, two, one, I'm gonna end the poll. All right, and I'm gonna share the results. All right, so you can see that no one said that this is a friend. <laughs> we have a lot of foes. Some say neither and some say it depends. Well, let me tell you what I decided. So um, here we go. So I'm going to say that it depends. So this is actually a May or June beetle, juvenile. It's called a grub. And we have a few species of white grubs here in Missouri. And there's actually an easy way to determine the, the, the species. You can see um, that the these are the four species right here. And you actually have to look at the raster. And I'll show you where that is. <laughs> to be able to determine the species. So you pick it up, you flip it over, you look closely at the bottom end, 
that that right here, that's the raster. Um, and then there's a there's a distinct pattern that's on it that will help you identify the grub. And I will put some links into the chat so that it'll be easy for you to to tell on your own. Now, why did I say that this depends? So this is again, it's called a grub. Um, and this right here is the adult. And notice that I said this is a beetle, not a June bug. Sometimes people call them June bugs, um, but there is a definite distinction between beetles and bugs. Some other interesting things about these, these insects, um, the brown beetle or June, June beetles are, they're usually brown, rusty, uh, or even black. They don't really have any patterns. They can be rather hairy underneath. They are nocturnal. So if you don't want them in your yards, I suggest you turn off your lights at night because they will come to them. They are rather flimsy or clumsy flyers as well. Now, they, these grubs can be very big. They can be, you know, around two inches, um, but it can depend. So it can be three quarters inch to two inches, but they can be kind of big. And the adults will eat plant leaves and they'll eat flowers. The larvae can eat the roots, but they also eat decaying plant material in the soil. So that's not necessarily all bad. So one of the way that you can tell if they're actually a pest is you need to cut a square foot of sod in your yard in several places. And you pull it back and you count the number of grubs and then you need to inspect that, that raster to be able to figure out what species they are. And the reason for this is it's perfectly normal to have these in your yard. So in a lot of ways, these are rather neutral insects. However, if you have more than 10 masked shaper grubs or more than five May or June beetle grubs per square foot, you might need to do some sort of a treatment at that point, because then, then it can become more of a pest issue and you can end up with, with problems. But if there are fewer than that, then it really is, it's a neutral situation and it's not really a pest. Um, and it's also, again, important to be able to identify them because I didn't just say if there's 10 grubs or if there's five grubs per square foot, I actually gave you specific recommendations, 10 mask shaper grubs or five May, June beetle grubs. Um, so it is important to be able to identify them. Now for treatments, uh, there are some various chemical treatments. There's cedar oil, it's a deterrent of, of feeding for these white grubs. Um, neem oil, garlic juice are also some that people have used. There are some other synthetic uh, chemical formulations that you can use. Um, you do need to make sure that you water them in thoroughly. Otherwise, it's not going to be able to work. It, it, it'll just pretty much be a useless treatment. So that goes back to what we always are saying. If you do need to use some sort of a treatment, please make sure you follow the label very carefully. The label is the law and it's, it's there to protect you and our environment. So that's what I have, thanks. Okay, thank you, Tamara. Well, we're dealing with weeds, lots of weeds due to the warm temperatures that we're having this week and all the rain that we've had. And we're gonna to try to focus on some different weeds each week. And today we're going to talk about hemlock because we, we've had a hemlock question come in and uh, Kelly is going to tell us about identifying hemlock and what you need to know about it. Okay, thank you, Jennifer. Can you see that? Yes, I can. Okay. Yeah, so this is a very timely talk a very timely topic because I've received several inquiries about this over the last couple of weeks and it is poison hemlock. So let's talk a little bit about this weed. So poison hemlock, and this is the scientific name, it's in the uh, carrot family. So it's, it's kin to some of our, our garden herbs and vegetables as well. But this is a pretty widespread toxic biennial plant. And it can be found about anywhere. It can be found in lawns. It can be found in open areas, fields, vacant lots, roadsides, just about anywhere. And you did read that right. It is toxic. So let's talk a little bit about um, why we're concerned about that. So all parts of the plant contain a toxin. 
And whether it be the leaves or the stems or the roots, it all contains this toxin. And if it's ingested in large enough amounts, it can be deadly to both us as humans and livestock and animals. Um, as far as skin irritation, I haven't heard a lot of reports from just getting a skin irritation from rubbing up against it. But with that being said, everyone is different. So if you do have poison hemlock on your property or in your yard, just be mindful that it does contain toxins and it can affect everyone differently. Now, a little bit about cattle, and I know that this is a, a homeowner uh, forum, but I do want to mention that uh, poison hemlock, there's a lot of concern with people that have livestock because not all livestock will readily eat poison hemlock. Um, they might take one bite of it and not like the taste and leave it alone. But occasionally you will get cows that will browse on it or new calves or, um, you know, sometimes that does happen. And if a pregnant cow ingests enough of, of the hemlock, it can cause deformities in the calf and it can even cause death as well. So it, it has to be consumed um, in, in fairly large amounts for that to happen. But, you know, you, you don't want it in your pastures in the first place because you never know what's going to happen. So do keep that in mind. You, you know, as far as humans, you would have to ingest quite a bit of that for it to kill you or cause any problems. And most of us are not going to be out there eating it anyway. And if you want more information about pasture, pasture control of hemlock, we do have some great guide sheets on our extension website, um, or you can contact one of our agronomists um, for more information on that. Now, there are some, some lookalikes to poison hemlock, and I've got some pictures here. Probably one of the most common plants that is misidentified is Queen Anne's lace. And Queen Anne's lace can also be found in many of the same areas as poison hemlock. Um, they both do have an umbral type flower and you can see that here, but the Queen Anne's lace is more, um, more, sod, more of a solid flower where the poison hemlock has some spaces in between the little clusters of flowers. Uh, the Queen Anne's lace also has fine hairs on the stem and poison hemlock does not. And poison hemlock also has some purple coloration on the stem as well. Now there are some other weeds and wild plants that are in this family that may look similar to hemlock. So if you have a plant and you're not sure what it is, you're, you're welcome to send in a photo to one of us and we can help you to identify that. But I did want to show you that there are some lookalikes out there uh, to be aware of. As far as control, um, it is a biennial plant, which means it takes two years for it to complete its life cycle. The first year, it will have what we call a rosette stage. And you can see a picture of that here on the left. And the rosette stage is just kind of a, a low growing um, first year part of the plant. It's very noticeable because it greens up very early in spring. And then the second year, it will send up its flower head and go to seed. The most effective thing that you can do is apply some type of a herbicide on that first year rosette. And that could be something like Roundup or, um, you know, some kind of off-brand glyphosate, anything like that will take care of it. If you do notice that you have a patch of this, you may have to treat it annually or maybe several times of the year because these do have um, quite, a, quite a dense root system and sometimes just a surface application of herbicide won't kill that root. But whatever type of herbicide that you do use, make sure that you're reading the instructions carefully and protecting yourself and applying it correctly as well. Um, the, the key is going to be to not let this plant go to seed. Once it flowers and goes to seed, those seeds spread. And then before you know it, you may have a thicket of this plant. And they do get very, very tall. I've seen thickets of, of poison hemlock that are every bit twice as tall as I am. 
So, you know, treat those first year rosettes, uh, keep it mowed down. If you do have patches that are starting to send up the, the flower heads, um, and again, it may take several treatments before you're able to kill out the area. So do be on the lookout for this. It is very, very common in all areas of our state. And, you know, just, you know, you don't have to be, you know, you don't have to freak out about it if it's in your, you know, in, in your backyard, but do be aware of it. Do take steps to keep it under control. Make sure that you don't eat it, which probably none of us are going to do anyway, but do watch children around it. And if you do have it in pastures with livestock, take steps to get it under control there as well. And Jennifer, that's all I have. Okay, thank you, Kelly. Well, this hit has been hard on spring bulb flowers like tulips and daffodils. And I know in Southern Missouri, the daffodils are probably long gone, but here in Northern Missouri, I've had some daffodils uh, still in bloom, you know, as of the weekend. And well, even yesterday, they were just barely hanging on, but this heat has been really uh, hard on them. And we're here at the end of the, the tulips, uh, end of tulip time. And I wanted to talk about how to care for the bulbs and bulb foliage once the flowers have faded. All right, so the flowers that you see in the photos uh, here are ones that I have grown in my yard. I love tulips. Tulips are my favorite uh, bulb flower. I like hyacinths too. Actually, I like all bulb flowers, but tulips are my favorite. And just this morning I went out and I cut the last of the tulips that still looked pretty good because we are predicted to have around 93 degrees today for our high. And I know that at that temperature, they're going to fade very quickly. So I went and cut them, put them in a vase of water, put them in my house, that's a lot cooler. And hopefully I'll get to enjoy them for a few more days. But um, you can see, I, I like tulips and you can see the different colors I grow. Um, I, I, yeah, I grow a lot. Um, I don't grow the dark, real dark purple ones. Um, and I know that those are some that are out there on the market. All right, so let's talk about how to care for bulbs once they are finished blooming. So you would want to cut off the flower stalks to prevent seed formation. And you may notice that there's a little, uh, little structure, round structure at the top of the stem where the flower petals have all fallen off. If you leave that, that's gonna continue to grow and develop uh, seeds. So what I'll do is cut those flower stalks off and that does prevent them for, from forming seed. You want to leave the foliage when it is finished blooming. You do not want to cut that off right away. It's recommended to leave that on the plant for at least six weeks after they're finished blooming. And you want to wait till that foliage turns brown. This allows the energy from the leaves to build up the bulb for next year's blooms. So if you cut it off too soon, the plants or the bulbs are not going to be able to photosynthesize and store energy in the bulbs to produce flowers for next year. So always wait till that foliage has uh, died down and turned brown and then cut it back. In the meantime, you can add some annuals in and among that foliage to add some color and to hide that foliage. I also wanted to address what to do with potted bulbs. So this is a potted uh, bulb arrangement here that was given to someone for Mother's Day and they were asking what to do with it, you know, how to care for it when it's done blooming. So again, you want, you want to do the same thing. You want to remove the stalks of the dead blooms when they die and then you want to plant the bulbs outside and you want to plant them in a sunny area. And then the foliage will die down as we go through the summer. And when that foliage is dead, you can cut it back. And then hopefully those bulbs will bloom again next spring. So it's basically the same kind of care, you know, cut that flower stalk off, plant it in the ground, cut the foliage off, and then wait for next spring and hopefully you get a bulb. But we don't always get flowers the following spring because critters like voles like to feed on flower bulbs. So voles are herbivores, moles are carnivores. 
So the bowls are what is usually after your tulip bulbs and other bulbs. And they, they will eat plant roots and tubers. They will eat mushrooms, berries, seeds, and nuts, and the bark of shrubs and small trees. And they also have a fondness for flower bulbs. So here you see the anatomy of a vole. Notice the short tail. So voles are typically brown in color, maybe a mousy brown. They have a short tail and they have small ears. You should be able to identify them uh, over a, a mole. They are a little smaller. They, moles tend to be a little more gray in color. And already this year, my cat has caught two voles. My cat caught a vole in my spinach bed, my raised bed where I have spinach. I saw the cat in there and the cat wouldn't get out and I shoot it out and it came back. Sure enough, there was a vole hiding under the spinach leaves and then the cat caught it and the cat ate it. So if you have a good uh, cat, uh, cat that's a good hunter, uh, that may help with, with uh, your vole problems. So some things that you can do to keep the bowls from eating your bulbs are to use a wire mesh screening that allows the shoots to grow through. And here in the photos, you can see how they've done it. So you want to get some wire mesh if you don't have any. And there is some information on the internet how to do that or contact one of us. We'll be glad to uh, talk, talk you through on how to, how to do this. And I thought I'd mention that if you have issues with voles, there are some plants that voles typically avoid. And those are Lenten rose, a hellebore, uh, snowdrops, grape hyacinth, daffodils, jack in the pulpit, crown imperial, salvia, and irises. So those are the ones that uh, voles typically stay away from. And I thought I would just add these photos in. This is a grower, this is Amanda. She's a cut flower grower in Randolph County near Huntsville. And I've worked with her on setting up an irrigation system. And we had a field day at her uh, farm last year. And Amanda grows lots of tulips and she grows lots of other flowers too. And if you're from Randolph County or from the area, uh, Amanda will let you come out and see her, her farm. She also sells her flowers at the uh, Randolph Mercantile in uh, Moberly. So Moberly, uh, for those that are from other parts of the state, Randolph County is, is the, the county where Moberly is at, north of Columbia. And then I, I like looking at the commercial flower farms. These are uh, from areas that grow uh, tulips commercially. And I think they're so pretty. And this time of the year, you'll see these circulating on Facebook or on the internet. And I just love looking at uh, the tulip fields. And I've had uh, colleagues or friends that have gone uh, overseas on ag tours and, um, and seen these commercial fields. So. And that's all I have. Jennifer, we do have one question on that topic and that is, should you add bulb food after flowering? You can add uh, bulb food um, that, you know, some people do that. Uh, I don't, I never do, but it, it is certainly sold in garden centers and it is, you know, it's, it's made for bulbs. So, you know, that's just my thoughts on that. Um, if the rest of you want to chime in, you know, go ahead. Any other thoughts on that? I agree with you. Um, I guess if I was uh, not having very okay. good uh, flowers. So going on to, or moving on to our last topic, um, asparagus is ready for harvest and people are picking it. Um, I'm going to say probably throughout the state here in Northeast Missouri, we are, uh, harvesting asparagus at this time, and the asparagus beetle is a problem, and Tamara is going to tell us about that. Thank you. So, all right, so asparagus is a wonderful, delicious food, um, and, and we want to make sure that we're taking care of it. So I do have some resources I'm going to put in the chat for you on care, because we've already talked about how to care for um, asparagus, but um, right now, there are some things that we need to do. Um, we need to be picking it. Really, that's pick it, eat it, enjoy it, but also watch for the asparagus beetle. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that, what you're gonna be looking for. 
So there are actually two different kinds, but this one is the most common. Um, it, it's the most significant insect pest of asparagus. So it's about a quarter of an inch long. It's bluish black wings um, have creamy yellow spots with red borders. I personally think it's actually a rather beautiful beetle, but I might be biased. So anyway, this adult beetle will overwinter in your crop residue or in trash or in, in around trees um, in your garden or field. But as soon as those spears start to emerge in the spring, this beetle will come over and it will start feeding on the spear tips. It also will start laying eggs on the spears. So um, this, this is what can happen. It's maybe a little bit hard to see, but you, if you look at this spear, you can see that it's starting to kind of hook over. And that, that's some of the damage that can happen when this adult beetle starts to feed on it. Um, it also can turn it a little bit brown. Uh, so definitely want to control this. Um, so let's see, this is the other asparagus beetle. It again is less common. It's kind of the reddish brown. It has 12 black spots. Um, it is not to be confused with a ladybird beetle or a ladybug. This is also what the asparagus beetle larvae look like, well, specifically the common, um, the common asparagus beetle larvae looks like. So they are light gray, they have a black head. The spotted asparagus beetle larvae is actually gonna be orange. So again, do not confuse these with uh, ladybugs. Um, the ladybug larvae also could be confused for, um, with the, the asparagus beetle larvae, um, but they're very beneficial. So, so what do you do um, with, if you find these things and these are the eggs that, that they're laying, um, what, what can you do to take care of this? Well, if it's a home planting, then you could actually go out and you could pick them off and put them in a, a bucket of soapy water. So that, that would probably be most effective for the people that are attending here. Um, it, unless you have like super large um, plantings of this, and then you might need to, to do some sort of chemical control. Um, for commercial growers, there are more control options available, but for uh, home growers, there, there definitely are limited um, control measures. So anyway, keep an eye on this, look for these um, and, and try, to, try to keep it from becoming a bigger problem um, this year and, and next year. That's what I have. Okay, thank you, Tamara. And that concludes our topics for today. At this time, I'm gonna turn it back over to Donna. Okay, so um, did we have any more questions since we have about five minutes? Yeah, we did have one other besides the bulb question. We, someone asked if wild parsnip was phototoxic. And um, yes. It has a chemical in it. Well, first I'll say that it also looks like Queen Anne's lace. It's also a biennial. And, um, but it does have a chemical in it that can cause severe sunburn in people and animals if they uh, eat them and, become, and then become exposed to sunlight. And um, so it can occur on the really light parts of the skin, but not on the dark parts. It's also toxic through all plant growth stages and uh, it's important, as always, as we mentioned, ident identify it correctly before you start control. Now, does any, and, and it'll be probably pretty tough to control, might need it um, more than one application of a herbicide to control it. And if it's really large, you uh, may have to remove it by hand. Um, of course, you can talk to an agronomist if you're concerned about your animals. And you can talk to one of us if you're trying to identify. Did anybody else have um, um, uh, anything to add about the, um, the wild parsnip? I don't know a lot about it. I just uh, was able to find that real quick. Yes, I know about it. So this is Jennifer. <laughs> we have had it in our fence line and on our property uh, in the past. And we do try to keep it uh, cut out and treated with herbicide. And my son and I have both been exposed to it um, and it leaves, it, on my skin, it, it bubbles up, it causes blisters and I, I get affected by it worse than poison ivy. And it 
is, I mean, it lasts for several weeks before it really goes away. And then it leaves like a, a red mark on the skin. And my son, um, who at the time was probably 12, had, uh, I mean, he blistered up too, but he had a red mark from where the blisters were for a few months. So it can last on your skin for a while. And we treated it the same way as poison ivy, but it just takes a while to go away. So it is not something you want to be touching with bare hands. Uh, I probably had gloves on when we were working with it, trying to get rid of it, but I probably had a short sleeve shirt on because it was probably 90 degrees or higher out. And that's probably how I got it um, because I had it on my arms uh, he had it on his legs. He and he he would be wearing shorts in ninety degrees. So yeah, don't touch it. It's it's uh, not fun to uh, have on your skin. Uh, I'll just say too that we got a comment saying, um, and thank you for this comment. Great timely topics today. Thank you. And I'll just remind you to please send us any questions on timely topics or any other uh, questions that you might have. We really like getting your questions and we love your comments. That's, I, that, I, there's no more questions. Let me double check. Yep, no more questions, Donna. Well, I think in that case, um, here are the dates for the future um, education hours. Um, so we're still doing every week on Wednesdays from noon to one. And just remember that um, you can find any of these recordings um, at the YouTube MUIPM page. So you just go to YouTube and then type in the search bar MUIPM and it will pull up uh, the, that page. And then you can watch the snippets. You can uh, go and rewatch anything that had been live streamed. So there are lots of different re, uh, good resources at that web page. Um, so, and then of course, keep checking back from week to week um, since we are um, picking out a snippet every week to have as a mini video. Um, so we're always adding to that website. Anytime you wish to have a question at, answered during the, this session, you wanna go back to the original place you registered and you will ask your questions here. Um, so just fill out this and, and your question down here. And there's also a way now that you can submit a picture. Um, and I've, it would be helpful if I probably updated that. I will have that updated by uh, for next week to show you how to upload a picture. Or I, I guess it would be emailing a picture. Um, so thank you for joining us. Hopefully everybody has had a nice noon break and cooled down from this hot weather and um, in a little few hours, we can get back there in the evening and get out and start planting once again. So join us uh, next week on Wednesday um, at noon for our The Garden Hour and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>